I'm John Travis in Mullumbimby, New South Wales on the 23rd of March, 2020, talking to Barbie and Larry Dossie in, where in New Mexico? In Santa Fe. In Santa Fe. Right. Santa, Fe. Santa Fe, yes. Um, where it's the 22nd of March. And <clears throat> delighted to get you both. And uh, uh, I'm not sure when the last time I saw you, Larry. I think it was a uh, something you were doing in Berkeley um, in the yeah, last that, century, probably. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, <laughs> vaguely uh, familiar, but it was a, some time ago. Yeah, you, and Barbie, have we ever been face to face? I'm not sure. I think one time, maybe about 20 years ago, at one of those big mega conferences of uh, alternative therapies. Well, anyway, I hope to get to know you a lot better, who you are and why, in this, uh, this time together, because <clears throat> what you've both done is, is well documented. But the fact that you're a team and um, um, still going strong in this day and age uh, is what I want to capture. So uh, I'll, I'll start first with you, Barbie, and uh, find out a little bit about where you were born, uh, siblings, uh, were you, uh, did you play nurse as a kid, and uh, what your education was, leading up to when you met Larry, and then we'll, we'll oh. switch over to Larry, and then we'll put the two of you together in your, your okay. uh, career. Oh, very briefly, I was born in Little Rock, Arkansas, and I uh, have a twin brother, uh, who and I'm the oldest and do act like the oldest. Uh, he's 13 minutes younger and have a sister that is three and a half years younger than us. Oh, the whole family, uh, mom and dad named us all with B's, Barbie, Bo, Bev, Boyd, and Betty. Uh, <laughs> Bo was a, his given name is Boyd and he's a junior, but uh, he started getting that nickname when we were born 77 years ago. <laughs> uh, I got Barbie and he got Bo. Uh, so, and it is stuck, and that's what our family and friends call us. Uh, I Did I play nurse as a child? Well, one thing I do remember, I had a little woman, uh, you know, the little women dolls, and I had the yeah. doll Joe, and uh, my, it was in like maybe the fourth grade, and my science fair project was what is a healthy medicine chest, and so daddy, uh, got me uh, two medicine chests and I did a very medicine, uh, messy medicine chest and a good medicine chest. But mother took my doll, Joe, and she made her a nursing uniform. <laughs> <laughs> so that is uh, that. Uh, so did I play nurse growing up? No. But I did have three first cousins that were 10, 12, and 15 years older than I was. And to and when we would go visit my granddaddy, uh, who lived with his brother and his family, uh, to see my three cousins come in uh, as nurses in their white capes. This was back in the you know 40s and 50s, in uh, the blue cape and in their hats and their caps, and their mom and dad just wanting to know what their days were like because then single women still lived at home. They, they didn't live in an apartments. Uh, so it was, uh, that got into my psyche. And then we were on a visit in my junior year down to visit granddaddy and all the rest of the relatives. And I was out on the back porch with my uncle Hoss and he said, well, Miss Barbara, you know, anybody wanted to get my attention, it was Barbara. Well, Miss Barbara, <laughs> what are you going to do with your life? And I said, and this was a, you know, junior in high school. And I said, Oh, uncle Hoss, I, you know, I'm going to college. I don't know what I'm going to study. And he just did like this. And he said, Miss Barbie, he said, you'd make a really good nurse. And I said, oh, you think so? And of course, you know, in my psyche were his three daughters. And then it turned out within a week, I had to go to my counselor in high school, beginning to look at college. And the question was asked, what do you want to be? And I just said, oh, I want to be a nurse. I'd never been in a hospital. I'd only been around my cousins. Our family had been very healthy and well. Uh, but I can say that uh, I did that. I was blessed to start in a baccalaureate program. Didn't know why that would be important. Then 10 years later, I went back and got a master's. And then 15 years later after that, I went back and got my doctorate in nursing. Uh, I uh, have never 
questioned why I was supposed to be a nurse. The universe wanted me to do it, and I've done it uh, diligently and to the best of my capacities. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and uh, uh, when did you first hear the word holistic? Was it before or after you met Larry? Uh, oh, uh, before that. Um, you know, just in nursing, I began to read the literature and I was working critical care and cardiovascular. And I was just thinking there's got to be more than drugs. And then I began to, you know, read about meditation and then I'll let Larry tell his story. Uh, well, that's five years later. <laughs> uh, but anyway, I was beginning to look at other possibilities of things to do and uh, had been to a couple of silent meditation retreats and, uh, you know, had been introduced to the word holistic and, and alternative therapies at the time. And then I will say I was in practice uh, for uh, two and a half years and Larry was finishing his, uh, his last month in medical school and he rotated on my critical care unit in 1967. And as I say, the rest is history. <laughs> So you heard of the word holistic in the 60s. Yeah. Uh-huh. That's yeah. before it was generally known in California anyway. Wow. That well, is but you know, I was reading it in the literature about health and well-being. Mind-body connections. And mind-body connections, reading about, you know, stress management and so forth. Yeah. I, I, I encountered that in the early 70s when I was in Baltimore, but you're way ahead of the curve. <laughs> So then, uh, just leading up to you, he was uh, on, uh, uh, where, uh, where were you actually? Um, well, I was at Baylor University Medical Center in Dallas. Okay. And Larry was in medical school at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical School. And he had done all of his uh, rotations in, uh, you know, charity or VA, and he wanted at least one month in a private hospital. And thank heavens, he came to my critical care unit. <laughs> uh -huh. It's my lucky so, day. <laughs> was it love at first sight? What? Uh, yeah. yeah, he took my breath away, and he still does. <laughs> wow. And, and were you um, on the floor when he walked in? And uh, I want to get a little too more of the uh, details. Well, actually, I had seen him um, in the cafeteria, and he was with other good looking nurses and so forth. And I just went, Ooh, he's interesting. He hadn't rotated on my unit yet. This was his first day. And then I went uh, to the unit. Uh, I'd been in morning meetings. You know, I was the supervisor, but I had to, uh, you know, had been going to meetings. And then he was making rounds with three of my favorite docs. And there he was, and he was going to rotate with them for a month. Uh -huh. <laughs> All oh, right, what a story. <laughs> and uh, one more detail, like what, what was your first date? Oh my goodness, our first date was going to a chamber music concert at Southern Methodist, at Southern Methodist University. I can still remember what my hair looked like, what I wore. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's switch over and, and bring this story up to the same time with Larry and where were you born and siblings and uh, oh no, Barbie, there's one question I didn't ask. I'm sure everyone's wondering is, did you have a Barbie doll? No, I, I got that nickname eight years before that doll came on the market. But if it, once it was on the market, did, uh, did you have? No, I've never, I've never owned a Barbie doll. Well, okay, good. That's, I no, want that for the record. I will tell you the one doll I have right now in my life. Would you have me, Ruth? She's right behind me. She's right there. Can you see who this is? It's Ruth, it's Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Uh, yeah. I, I was getting so distressed about our democracy, and I went, how does she do it? And I was flipping through, you know, eight or ten interviews and looking at her and all of a sudden here's this Barbie doll that <laughs> I'm Barbie pardon me Ruth an <laughs> RBG doll that comes up on the side and I went oh my gosh and I bought one and good. I've given I've given 10 to girlfriends good for you isn't she an inspiration <laughs> I'd love she to interview is. her <laughs> oh wow yeah thank you Ruth for joining us today yes yes we got three for the price of two so Larry <laughs> 
where and when and how? Well, uh, I don't know if I can pe compete with that, but uh, I grew up on a, uh, a sharecropper farm in central Texas. Uh, it was uh, very much poverty stricken. Uh, there was no tradition of education. Nobody in the whole history of our family had gotten past 10th grade. Uh, I was born an identical twin and uh, was lucky to have made it alive. My brother and I weighed just a little bit over two pounds. Uh, we were not predicted to live. We uh, defied the odds. I mean, this was a home birth no hospitals uh, in anywhere and uh, so no no incubators none of the fancy stuff somehow our grandmothers moved in and kept us alive uh, long story short we survived we uh, we excel in school we both got we finished one two in our high school class we had it uh, 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 scholarships to the University of Texas at Austin, where we, my brother and I graduated with high honors. For, somehow we wound up in medical school. I, I still don't understand that. They, there was no history of medicine and or nursing in our entire family. At any rate, uh, I fell in love with medicine and uh, I only wanted to become an internal medicine doctor and so that uh, that was what I did. Uh, I met Barbie in my last year in medical school on a rotation, as she's already said, in one of the best uh, private hospitals in Dallas, Baylor University Medical Center. It really was love at first sight. Uh, several years later, we, we married. We chose not to have children. This was interspersed. Uh, in 1968, 1969, with a tour of mine in Vietnam as a uh, field battalion surgeon. Uh, luckily, I survived that and uh, came back wow. into the residency. By this time, when I finished my medical training, I was hooked on the idea of mind-body connectedness. Uh, Barbie and I began the first uh, biofeedback laboratory, one of the first, it may have been the first in the entire state of Texas in a wow. private medical practice. Uh, she functioned as a medical uh, nurse. psychology <laughs> nurse <laughs> and uh, then worked full time in Critical my care. biofeedback laboratory. We were really now, was this in a, a, a group practice or where well, this was, was in a group practice of about 15 of my colleagues. Uh, I have and Barbie has been, we both have been fascinated by the connectedness of mind and body and physiology and health mm -hmm. and health. Actually, there's a backstory to that. I was, uh, I was afflicted uh, with a severe medical problem from my teenage years. Uh, this Jack was a classical migraine headache. Uh, I tried to drop out of medical school. This became severe with all the stress and tension in medical school. I thought that I would have one of these scotomas or blackout of my vision while I was attending a patient in a critical uh, situation and so I thought I'd, I had no business business becoming a physician. My faculty advisor said don't worry about it it always gets better as you get older he said uh, but in my case it got worse as I got older and uh, back in the early 70s you probably remember this back at the Manninger Foundation it was discovered that uh, people who learned how to do biofeedback and unstress their bodies and achieve a calm meditative state, they found out that if they had migraine headache, the migraine got better or simply went away. 
I chased all over the country learning how to be a subject in a biofeedback setting. And for the first time in my life, the headaches virtually disappeared. I thought, this is miraculous. I have to have, I have to make this <laughs> therapy available to the patients in my practice. That's why uh, Barbie and I started this biofeedback venture in Texas, in Dallas. And uh, this became a, kind of an avocation of mine. I became an expert in the mind-body literature. I read widely and I wrote books on the subject. So uh, I come to this mind-body connected idea by personal experience. This was something very real uh, to me in my medical practice and in my, my own personal health history. Now, were you working with Elmer Green at Menninger or what? Uh... Well, I was not working with Elmer, although I did. We had a lecture series in our hospital and I invited Elmer down from the medical clinic in Topeka uh, at the Menninger Foundation where he was pioneering all of this stuff. Right. And he lectured to our, I, I was the director of visiting professors. And so I asked him down and he put on a good show for the doctors in my hospital. What, wasn't he great? I mean, he, he looked so straight out of the 50s and he'd open his mouth. <laughs> I, I, know. Let me I asked him once, you know, we met in our, my office before he took the podium. I said, what are you going to talk about? He said, I'm not sure yet. <laughs> it was about 15 minutes before we right, talked. Right. But I think he was putting me on. But he, he was a great guy. I got to know him fairly well. Let me say something that's parallel there, too, uh, with yeah. my career. Uh, I was working critical care in cardiovascular, and this was a large hospital, uh, Medical City Dallas Hospital in Dallas. And uh, so the critical care unit was on, this, on the same floor, and I could go in a door to the back of Larry's clinic. Uh, and there were, you know, 45, 50 docs in that clinic. And so I would go in the back and then, would, then I would go into the biofeedback lab and I would go, oh my gosh, this biofeedback equipment is just like what I'm working with in critical care. But in the biofeedback clinic, when someone would have, um, you know, whatever the symptoms were, you would ask them to just pay attention to the cardiac monitors, to, to the cardiac monitors pay attention to their symptoms and then teach them the relaxation and imagery. And that's how I began to do that in my clinical practice in critical care. And, oh. when it, and then I realized that in critical care, we say it, we, to a patient, don't worry about the monitors, the nurses will take care of it. And then I came in one day and uh, I'll never forget that man. He had, he, you know, I do, my, do the drill that we were doing back in the 60s. And he said, okay, I won't look. Well, he has his bedside table and he pulls his bedside table and he flips up where the mirror and he can see his monitor in the mirror. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> and I went, oh my gosh, there is no reason that I can't begin to teach relaxation and imagery without permission. It is what I do as a nurse. I carry with me this capacity to use my voice as a healing instrument. And so oh. there was nothing, it, it just is another way to relax someone because everybody in the critical care unit is anxious. They don't want to be there. There's always something sure. new you know, coming up. And um, so the journey for me is when I started doing that and Larry by this time was chief of staff and he said, you are going to get fired from this hospital. He said, there's nothing I can do that will prevent that. And he said, you've got to start doing research. You've got to write protocols. And I went, well, that's a no brainer. And I love to work with girlfriends and, and, guys. <laughs> and so <clears throat> I began to, because I was always looked at then, oh man, here she's going again. What is she doing? And Larry said, well, just start writing the articles and doing that. I'd never, you know, written anything in my life. And just one protocol led into two to five, you know, the exponential, and then to find two or three like-minded colleagues that also recognize this. And then we started having brown bag lunches together and bringing healthy food. So all of this, rather than going down to the hospital cafeteria, which is where a place where people would just kind of 
you know, bitch and moan about what's not right. And I just went, you know, how can we shift this? And so with a couple of colleagues, we began to write protocols and have lunches, invite people to come bring their own lunches. And this was in the 70s. So I was, uh, as Barbie mentioned, uh, I was chief of staff of the entire hospital. And I uh, had a good deal of leverage about what I wanted to emphasize and uh, focus on as chief of staff. And I had a tremendous amount of authority and uh, respect. And uh, my colleagues yeah. knew that I would not put anything on the table that wasn't researched and uh, uh, stamped with approval by the profession. And so long story short, Jack, this, is the, uh, uh, this was a real journey of legitimization and popularization of the entire biofeedback notion that in those days, I'm telling you, was radical. Yeah. But we, we had yes. the, the chops to do this and get away with it. Uh, actually, we didn't get away with anything. Everything we did was uh, backed up by uh, studies in the literature, okay. which, you know, was a, a, a profusion of knowledge which erupted from everywhere uh, in the country looking at body mind influences in health uh today this looks like nothing i mean uh oh but then yeah. is not, nobody raises an eyebrow to met half the country is meditating i mean it was not <laughs> it was not so back in the early 70s as you Certainly know not yeah well so i remember reading barbara brown and i think it was 74 and uh getting uh, my own, I, I got hooked up with Autogenics in Berkeley and got one of their first temperature machines. And then uh, last time I saw Elmer, he said, we've just done this study with 12 hypertensive patients and we had 100% success and they won't publish it because they don't believe it. <laughs> it was yeah, too good. Yeah. yeah. Jack, let me also say another part of my learning curve too is I had gone with my twin brother down to Mexico um, uh, in 65 and I came back with a raging temperature and you know tourist I mean the whole vomiting diarrhea the whole thing and he had a fever of 103 anyway uh, about 12 hours after I was home I woke up with my right eye completely swollen shut and what it turned out to be was a dendritic keratitis a uh, fancy name for fever blister under cornea uh, and that was back in the day where we did not have any of the medications that we have now. There was one medicine. Yeah, it was called Era A. And uh, if you took it, you would wind up on uh, a, a dial, you know, on hemodialysis. And I was doing dialysis in critical care, and I went, no way am I doing that. But anyway, that was my learning curve to really truly understand what it meant to get off of the treadmill of the fast pace. And that was part of my, my, my well-being, my self-care and in introducing that to people. Finally, I had a corneal transplant in 1975. Uh, and uh, I still, you know, run a 20 to 30% rejection with my cornea. I haven't had any rejections since 76. Uh, but it is, again, my balance. And this is when you brought up autogenics, that's one of my favorite ones to do is just how can I get to that place of that inner calm? And one of my favorites is, you know, my right hand is warm and heavy and stay there and then do left hand, right leg, left leg. And of course, I have many other ways to do it now. But, but that was also another way of me deepening uh, the practice and the capacities to then work with like-minded colleagues in authorship and research studies to begin to make this uh, acceptable and, uh, and validate it. And I will also say that in 1980, I was invited to uh, be uh, to, to the founding meeting of the American Holistic Nurses Association. Mm -hmm. I figured and that. It's and it's thrilling that today, uh, today, uh, uh, it'll be interesting we're supposed to have our 40th conference and i am the uh, luckily and honored to be a keynote speaker and i will be speaking on florence nightingale and the 17 united nations sustainable development goals we will see that conference will 
probably be canceled, but they will do something with webinars, you know, throughout the year um, because of where we are right now with COVID-19. Yeah. Jack, I might mention uh, to give our listeners uh, some indication about how radical, truly radical this stuff was back in the 70s. When I first ordered biofeedback equipment, uh, <laughs> I thought it was marvelous. I was teaching my patients this way to relax uh, and conquer stress in their bodies. And after I've been using these machines, which I'd imported from Europe, in my office, I had a knock on the door one morning, and it was U.S. Customs agents <laughs> with this, these intimidating gold badges that they flashed. And I said, you know, doctors are about half paranoid anyway. And I thought, what sin have I committed? You know, why, why do I deserve being invaded by the customs agents? And they said, we're here to repossess your biofeedback equipment. And they said, the manufacturers in Holland have made spurious claims about what these gadgets can do. And this violates customs laws and we're here to repossess them. I thought, this can't get any crazier. And so I asked them, well, I, I like them. I mean, I'd like to keep them. Uh, what are my options? And they said, well, you can, destroy them while we watch. And so by this time, I didn't want to destroy these biofeedback oh, they were machines. Gorgeous. They were beautiful. Beautiful. Uh, and so, well, you either destroy them, they said, or we repossess them. So the last I saw of my biofeedback instruments was that they were walking out with these instruments under both arms disappearing down the long corridor in my medical office, and I never saw them again. So this was basically a government raid on my medical office, which uh, I hope puts into perspective the truly radical idea that this had in the culture. Yeah. Wow. Um, yeah, it was. Um, oh, I demonstrated uh, my biofeedback uh, machines on 60 Minutes in 79, and it was radical then. That was the Dan Rather interview. And uh, <clears throat> that was when we think the word wellness got injected, because Dan Rather opened the piece saying, wellness, now there's a word you don't hear every day. And we <laughs> so had this. Good for you. Yeah, when, when did your book come out? Uh, the first uh, mass market was 81, the wellness workbook, yeah. I had done a three ring binder version. Uh, we sold about 3,000 copies of that in 78. Mm -hmm. And that enabled me to get it to the publisher, uh, 10 Speed Press originally, and then it switched over to their Celestial branch. And now it's owned by Random House. But I wanna go back, Larry, to, uh, uh, there's a big gap here between you, uh, uh, no one in your family going past 10th grade and how'd you even get to college? And, and being an identical twin, that's a whole story in itself, plus a twin married to a twin. Uh, <laughs> there's some more backstory I'd like to fill in about what your earlier experiences were like and how did you manage to even get to college? Well, for, for some reason, my brother and I uh, were blessed with uh, a remarkable drive toward higher education. Uh, I, I really don't know where that came from. Uh, didn't come from the family. But the family, uh, mother and father, approved every step of the way. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were fortunate enough that the state of Texas gave scholarships to state universities for the first two uh, people who graduated in their high school class. Yeah. It didn't matter how big the high school was. It could have been Highland Park University, which was massive in Dallas, and or it could be just our little rural high school, which had 25 graduates, graduates in it. We were the first two graduates uh, in, in, in class. Wow. So we qualified for full scholarships at the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, I think somehow we, we would have found out 
some other way to finance things. But this made it really easier. And I take my hat off to the, to the state of Texas for making these uh, scholarships available. It certainly saved us a lot of wear and tear. Yeah. And, uh, and, and then your pharmacy. Time also. And, and my brother and I <laughs> graduated from the University of Texas with high honors. Uh, so I guess that gets back to genes and and something that I've always been grateful for in the history of their family. And now, they, graduated with, they graduated with degrees in pharmacy and then Larry worked as a pharmacist all the way through medical school. Oh, that's, oh. An, <laughs> that's another thing. We were then faced with how to pay for medical school. Uh -huh. And uh, my brother went to dental school and I went to medical school. And by that time we had registered pharmacy degrees having graduated in pharmacy from the University of Texas. And so we worked on weekends for four years as registered pharmacists, paying our way through medical school. So uh, I don't know how interesting this is to anybody, but uh, it, 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 it wasn't easy holding down a job uh, in medical school. So, but we managed to do it. and. Uh, we can't came out close to the top in our our uh, classes in medical school as well. What's your brother's name? Gary. And are you? Is he still alive and well? And are you close? Oh, he he just retired from dental practice back in Texas, but he's certainly alive and well and uh, very vigorous. And uh, we were identical, by the way. And uh, yeah, we. Uh, do you still have the same amount of hair and uh, part it in the... Uh, would, yeah. <laughs> would he substitute for you in this day and age? Or? No, no, he, weigh, he weighs more than Larry. Uh-huh. So, well, that's fascinating. And uh, so it sounds like you guys were really supportive of each other all the way through and... Uh, uh, we were just was, like this. And we still are right. extremely, extremely right. close. and in every way. Wonderful. Now, what's it like being married to a twin? Twin? Are there any? Uh... Well, I wouldn't trade it, frankly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think one of the things that is in, important about this story is twins do have a language between them. You know, so you always mm -hmm. know what the other one's going to do. And there, there's just a knowing there. And also, you certainly know about Larry's work, and you'll say something about that. But but for us to have that experience early on of like, if my brother was, um, when he was in an accident, I get, I get that experience, my breath is literally knocked out of me. And then five hours later, I'm called that he's, you know, had that accident. So wow. that kind of knowing at a distance uh, is, so we've had many of those conversations. So when Larry began to develop these notions and, well, I'll let him say that, but it's just like, of course, of course. Yeah. And then that, that's, you know, part of our psyche. Many yeah. years ago, I became fascinated with the concept that consciousness is shared between individuals and, uh, and wrote a book. Premonitions. One mind. Uh, Okay. One, one mind, uh, uh, going into all of the anecdotal as well as the scientific evidence that suggests that consciousness is unitary and uh, shared between individuals. And I, I have no doubt that my experience as an identical twin yeah. uh, sort of paved the way, oh. uh, made, made me open to the, to the evidence for the concept that as David Bone, the physicist said, thoughts belong to everybody. Yeah. So the relationship between my twin brother and me and between Barbie and her twin brother was living evidence that uh, the one mind is not just a metaphor, it's a real thing. And, well, uh, and your, your premonitions book had a huge impact on me and the statistics and I, I quote that frequently still. And, uh, that that came earlier, right? Before the One Mind book, it yes. came. Uh, it came earlier. Yes. Uh, well, 
there's still uh, some gaps in the in your medical history of from uh, in Vietnam to uh, chief of staff at uh, is it Dallas City? Is that the right name? Medi medical medical ci medical city Dallas. Medical city Dallas. Yeah. Um, so residency and and uh, how did the two of you manage? What you were in Vietnam uh, after you met and you know. Can you well, when I. Uh, uh, graduated from medical school and went into an inter internship at, uh, which lasted for a year at the VA hospital in Dallas and Southwestern Medical School. All of the doctors were getting drafted. This was at the height of the Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't have a choice. It was either uh, emigrate to Canada and give up my U.S. citizenship. Yeah. Uh, and besides that, I was really tired of internship in medical school, and uh, I actually volunteered for the Army. I thought I would get a sign, an assignment that didn't take me to Vietnam if I volunteered, but I was wrong. I got sent to Vietnam, and I spent a year in the field uh, tending to kids. They were mostly kids who were wounded and shot up and uh was lucky not to become killed or wounded myself but it was a harrowing year and i was lucky to come out of it unscathed and then i went came back after two years spending two years in the u.s army and uh most of my medical school colleagues were coming back from other assignments also and so we decided that we would all enter our internal medicine residency together at the VA hospital. And we had a just a great group of uh, smart. medical <laughs> residents. Smart, and then smart. Uh. when we finished two years of residency, we decided to go into practice together. Oh, that's how that happened. There were, the, there were a dozen of us who had been together since medical school and through the military and through medical residency. And we just came together and formed what, and, go ahead. <laughs> what became one of the most prestigious medical groups in the city of Dallas. And we were waiting on this new hospital to be built. So we're able to go into this new hospital and I'm doing critical care, cardiovascular. I mean, it was just, it was so exciting. Uh, it just, oh, it was just amazing. But with Larry's group, the guys had, uh, and there was at that there a woman came later, but the initial group were were guys. Uh, but one was head of gastroenterology, one was head of internal medicine, one was head of uh, heme, uh, hematology, hematology uh, another one cardiology. <laughs> and so you know here is this glorious uh, group of internal medicine docs with all these subspecialties. It was it was fantastic. Yeah. So now, what was it like for you while you were in Vietnam, two years or one year? One year, and then I came back and I was assigned to Fort Carson Medical Center in Colorado Springs for my second year in the Army, and that's where I spent my second year. Right, and then I was uh, working critical care while he was gone. And the other thing that I did too is I joined the Texas Air National Guard. And uh, then, you know, had the, the rank of uh, a captain since I had graduated with a college degree, well, lieutenant, and then went to captain. Um, and the thing that was very interesting about that is uh, then Larry's brother, uh, he uh, did not go. He had family at the time. So, you know, that was, you know, one thing that happened In then. Dental school. At, and dental school, and he had a, a big practice and Gary joined me in the, that same group. And the fascinating part about it is uh, one of the films that we had gotten because we were in charge of keeping these, you know, 50, 60 medics field ready in case our unit got called up. And one of the field hospitals was at an LZ uplift where Larry had been and it really got everybody's attention, but it certainly got Gary's and my attention about you know what what we need to be doing. Uh, I think the other thing that's very interesting about that period of time is uh, Larry and I certainly got to know each other in a very different way because it's the old letter writing. And mm -hmm. I finally we did get these little reel to reel 
it, you know, and made tapes, but it would take, if I would write a letter or a tape, it would be 10 days to two weeks before then I would hear back from him. So we did all of this. Uh, one of the things I do remember is sending Larry rhythm strips from the critical care unit to keep him, uh, you know, ready uh, and to know when he got back what rhythm strips were and keep him updated on medicines that we were now using, stuff like that. <laughs> ah. What's an LZ uplift? Well, it was a landing zone, LZ for landing zone. Oh, okay. it, was, it was a place in the battlefields in right. Vietnam. Yeah, he, had, wa he wasn't in a mass unit. That had artillery and Bunkers. Uh, bunkers, and it was out on the edge uh, among the enemy. Now, what year did you graduate from med school? 1967. 67, and, so you're two years ahead of me. Okay. I wound up in the public health service, so I was in between. And, uh, well, good for you. <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd done a medical school thing uh, with their COSTEP program at the Indian Reservation in San Carlos. Arizona, so that got me in the door, but uh, it was a scary time. And uh, now, when did you first hear the word holistic, Larry? I don't even remember. You know, there was a series of words that were used back then that have vanished. I mean, I don't know anybody yeah. who uses holistic anymore. Uh, I, it it came with a lot of freight. I'm, I recall uh, people criticizing joggers in Dallas, you know, people who just for some strange reason would run around streets in shorts. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this, this is considered extremely rare, weird. And then there were these people that were called healthcare, healthcare nuts who would actually go to stores and buy vitamins and, and, yeah. and superfoods. Yeah. I mean, these were considered off, off the charts. And, you know, and holistic got attached to that and yeah. in mind, body, and I don't, you know, we, we were continually changing the language. Uh, so I, I, I'm unable to put a specific time date on the holistic. But by the 80s, yeah, I would say by the 80s, uh, the 80s, we were being invited uh, to speak you know, from our perspective in different kinds of conferences that we're looking at, you know, health and well, <coughs> well-being and mind-body connections. So that's, you know, how, how we got out there. <laughs> uh, you just reminded me that I had to go to a, a Chinese uh, grocery store in downtown Baltimore to get tofu. Uh, <laughs> this was in, uh, what, 73, probably 72. Um, I remember the first time I met you, Larry, it was a, a filming and Will Schutz and I had come from California and you were there and a few other people. Yeah. I don't remember what, where it even was, uh, somewhere south of where I was. Do you remember? Yeah, I sure do. Yeah, that was a good meeting. I treasure that memory. Uh, wh where were we and when? <laughs> we were, I think we were somewhere in California, but I, uh, Southern California, it must have been L.A., yeah. Uh, right, that's what I'm thinking, L.A. And I, I was still at the stage of finding other docs who were weird like me. And uh, the first one I ever met was Rick and Grassi, had flown out from um, Boston with Peggy Taylor, who was editing New Age magazine. And, yeah. and he sounded like we, me. It was like, what, what? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> then I met uh, Elliot Dasher, who had come out to meet me, and uh, uh, I had lunch with him and his wife next door to our center, and he had this heavy New York accent that I have some <laughs> prejudice about, and he was talking like a, a new yeah. age, what, what? <laughs> it was rare in those days to find other doctors. Of course, Tom Ferguson was doing medical self-care magazine, but he he converted as a medical student. <laughs> <laughs> he got me into the AMSA meeting, and uh, that's where Dean Ornish came to that meeting, apparently, and was uh, remembered oh, my, my Dean. And you took care of his dad. Well, yeah, I, did, I, I had a close connection uh, with Dean via his father. Uh, his uh, family lived in Dallas, and so right. they migrated to me uh, for their internal medicine care. 
And so I got to know his doctor really well. And so it was, his uh, dad. <laughs> and he was a great guy and he was so proud of Dean. And so yeah. I got to know Dean via his father. Well, uh, he, he described when I interviewed him, how his father didn't quite plan for him to go that direction, but he came around as yeah. my dad did too. My dad didn't understand what I was doing. And he was at an Ohio um, uh, medical association meeting and, <clears throat> at a lecture and one of the professors said oh you're john travis's father and oh. so he heard of me that that gave me some legitimacy <laughs> so he, he knew you couldn't be too crazy oh, that's great. right right but yes those th those days in the 70s were uh we couldn't even decide whether to spell holistic with a w or not um gladys okay. said it they had debated that for many hours <laughs> right <laughs> i know but, the good old days, yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, my father so, was a farmer and uh, didn't really understand uh, what what the whole deal was all about, but he was totally approving. You know, anything that his twin boys took up and wanted to do right. was the right thing to do. So huh. we experienced total <laughs> affection and total love from our parents and total approval. Wonderful. That's that's a rare thing in this day and age, I think. I had the same unconditional love and support from my parents. Wow, you guys are in the single digits, I think. We were oh, we were blessed. I think you're right. Yeah. Yeah. We were having a conversation on part of a, a virtual group that deals with attachment and and uh, uh, connection that way, and uh, we're all in that field and the prevailing belief is that about 50% of Americans are securely attached and none of us think it's more than single digits, yeah. low single digits, because that, you know, Mary Ainsworth somehow got her numbers screwed up because she was in Africa and saw how the Ugandans were connected and big difference between that and her study in Baltimore. But anyway, yes. um, so you went from pharmacy, uh, you could have been a tool of big pharma, um, a complete turnaround here to uh, tell us a little more how you got, um, how that happened. Uh, biofeedback, which was the tool for me too, but you were at it even sooner. Um, what else? Um, I, I, uh, I, I'm not sure I know, because, but one of the important thing is that I, I just had a voracious appetite for information. And uh, from earliest days after medical school, I began to read widely outside of medicine, uh, outside of psychology. Uh, Eastern literature was a huge spur in my intellectual development. But also, in the 80s, it, uh, you probably remember that uh, there was a flood of books from the field of modern physics that yeah. uh, began to surface. Fritjof Capra's book, mm -hmm. he wrote the foreword yeah. to my first book. Uh, oh. And so I began to think about the role that physicists were revealing for consciousness and the elaboration of modern quantum mechanics. And the idea of an observer effect uh, was extremely strong, which obviously had something to do with consciousness. And so in my mind, the revelations from consciousness research and medicine begin to cohere with the, inter with the intrinsic messages coming through quantum mechanics. There were a great many people who began to come forward in quantum mechanics championing consciousness. This seemed to have everything to do with coherence between I was, what I was seeing in biofeedback and from <laughs> clinical medicine. So the cohesion of modern physics and modern medicine made a tremendous impact upon my thinking. I began to write books about this, uh, such as Space, Time, and Medicine, and many <coughs> others, uh, trying to unify these ideas. And I began to lot, get a lot of uh, encouragement from people on, in non-medical areas of science, such as Fritjof, Fritjof, David Bohm, and I began to strike up a conversation. He was very sick at the time. And I attended conferences with the physicists 
elaborating from the standpoint of medicine what I was observing that had to do with what they were observing. So wow. it was a beautiful kind of marriage. Uh, uh, I recall that uh, the Esalen Institute had a very small conference of about 10 people who were in, invitees to discuss physics mm -hmm. and consciousness. And for some strange reason, I was invited and I uh, was tremendously inspired by the insights of these physicists who were at the outskirts uh, of physics. The Bay Area of Physics, there's a book out about how physicists, yes. how hippies <laughs> say physics. So I was part of that movement. And uh, yeah. so I, just because of a very broad appetite, I was able to bring certain fields together and uh, for what I it's worth. I know that connection. I, I met Fred Wolf early on. Well, actually their book, his book was Jack Sarfati, which fascinated me. I couldn't understand half of it, but I carried it around, you know, and uh, then uh, a guy named Hardy Jones organized meetings and, and Free Joff and Jack and, and Fred were there and uh, they did a, a role play once of Werner Heisenberg and the other guy having a, 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 a battle Moore. of wits. Yeah, yeah, and um, so I was exposed to it that way as well. And uh, I can't track down Fred Wolf. He's not responding to me lately. I, I, I haven't heard from Fred in years. Yeah. I'll yeah. tell you something, he was still active though. You may know the name Nick Herbert, who wrote yeah. several books on consciousness and the role yeah. of the mind uh, in physics. And, and he was extremely instrumental in my development of these ideas. I, I still refer to, Nick is a mentor of mine and I owe him so much because he had the patience to nurse me along. Somebody who knew, knew very little about physics from, from the beginning, but uh, he would send me papers which he uh, had selected for me to read to come up to speed. So I owe Nick Herbert quite a bit. Is he still alive or I don't know? He is. Oh, yeah. He still has a website. If you Google Nick Herbert, you'll come in. Okay. And he has I, a great beard and it's very long. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I had a, a, a strange connection of, uh, speaking of, of um, David Bohm, um, was one of my dear friends who had just come from a, a week with Brew Joy back in the 70s, burst into our office at closing time, and uh, somehow we became good buddies. Um, Bob Tollickson was his name. And he was murdered in the 90s by a psychotic patient he was assessing. And I tracked down his son, who I'd known as a teenager, who was the chair of physics at Chapman University and was bringing uh, Arnoff over from the Bohm-Arnoff effect, which I hadn't even known about. I knew about Bell's theorem. I didn't know its origins. Yep. And Jeff was now the age as his father was when I met his father, like, 30 years earlier, mm -hmm. and uh, told me that uh, I had gone out to, to uh, Benton Harbor, Michigan, where they live, or Stevensville, to give Bob a ketamine session, because my transformation occurred around the time of my first marriage, divorce, separation from my daughter, very depressed. I worked with Rich Jensen, who had been with um, um, John Lilly and, and um, um, holotropic, uh, da, da, holotropic breathwork, who's that? I'm blocking names. Stanislav Groff. And Groff, yeah. He had been a graduate student with them and he worked with me. They had since shut down the program at, um, at Spring Grove and blew my mind, you know, this ketamine. I, I, nothing else affected me. I was a tough case. So anyway, I gave some sessions to some other friends after that, and one of them was Bob. And it turns out that Stephen, I mean, uh, um, Jeff, had talked me into giving him a, a session at their house. He was 16 years old. I didn't remember this at all. It <laughs> influenced him so much. He went off to MIT. He spent a summer uh, with uh, another famous physicist, uh, the, uh, whose name I always block that uh, wrote a lot of, of lay people's books. 
And he said this influenced his work in uh, consciousness. So uh, the physics people, big, big, strong connection. I know. Um, didn't mean to go off on that long rant. But um, now the two of you together, um, how, how has your work cross-fertilized each other? We, we know you've written a number of books, Larry. And yeah. uh, Barbara, you were involved in AHNA founding right. that and uh, I met a, a woman online who actually married the uh, mother of a high school classmate of mine after her father died or her, her husband died and uh, Wendy Wetzel I don't know if you met her or not of course <laughs> Larry knows Wendy too yeah. yeah well I interviewed her a month or so ago because I, I remembered her I had to look her up I couldn't even figure out where she was she still had the same phone number i had that I love it. database I love it. so uh, well, to answer your question uh it has certainly been um a blessing that the universe put us together neither of us had written before we got together but as we're talking and then building our network of uh people like-minded colleagues and beginning to write and do research uh, we're supporting each other i i have more of an external way of working i like to work with like-minded colleagues larry uh does solo work and then he works with colleagues but it's just different with where he was compared to where i was uh but to, but just to look at the ideas coming together and the support of each other and you know larry early on saying the only way you're going to have any validity at all is if you begin to write and to do some research and so one thing led to another and uh each of us uh you know continue to write and i'm thrilled to say that my holistic nursing a handbook for practice is going into the eighth edition it'll be out in 20 2020 um just what in a few months we're getting ready to read the galleys right now uh, it has been uh, something that has been extraordinary how we have validated each other. Um, I think one of the things that really stands out in my mind is I think about our early work is to have situations that happen in clinical practice and then to come home and say, you know, at the end of the day, listen to this. What do you think about it? Mm -hmm. And then Larry would, you know, he's listening to stories differently and, and, to, and that's, the depth of the work is everybody has a story and if you can allow people to tell their story much of the time they know what it is they need but they need some validation most of all they need to be listened to mm -hmm. and then when you begin to help people tell their story then this is where we as a nurse physician we move into that role of facilitating healing and we're not having to give people the answers. We're not having to fix things. But it's that presence of being in this we space. And that is a deep, profound experience. So this is one of the ways that we've certainly you know, supported each other in many different ways. <laughs> well, I want to sanction that. And I would add also that uh, one of the main reasons why my work was taken seriously and uh, my profession was that uh, I was a board certified internist and I, mm -hmm. I, I dealt with sick and dying patients for decades. So my experience was not just a matter of philosophizing and coming up with uh, thoughts that had occurred to me that in which I would say, you know, just take my word for it. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't do that. And I stayed on the front lines for a long time. And, uh, you know, I'm finishing my 15th book uh, currently. And so these are, these have embedded in them my experience as a doctor at the bedside responding to the life and death needs of other human beings. And I think that that quality pervades my work. And uh, it's like, look, don't take my word for it. Here's clinical evidence mm -hmm. and other studies that other people have done. So if you want to reject what I have to say, you'll re be rejecting 
a bunch of stuff that comes out of clinical medicine, modern science, modern physics, and uh, my own personal experience. So I think a person's inner life, their experiences go into what they put on paper. I don't think you can get away with this. Readers are very savvy. They have a way of knowing if, if you have plumbed the depths of human experience or not. And I think that's so important for a writer to do, to be able to convey the idea that I was there, I have seen this, and I have experienced it. Right. Otherwise, you don't have any business writing. Well said. Now, have, what are, have been some of your more unpleasant moments of skeptics? And are, are you listed in the skeptics? That I know they have a whole web a Wikipedia network of uh, BS. Yeah, I, actually, if you want to have a real joke, just look at the Wikipedia page of Larry Dawsey, which was constructed for me by skeptics. I would be the first to uh, acknowledge that I have a lot of enemies who think that what I do is really uh, not respectable and uh, they are not timid. They're professional skeptics. They lie, they misrepresent. And uh, mm -hmm. so that, that's just a fact of life. It's impossible to change permanently a Wikipedia page. It's not just me. My good friend, Rupert Childrake, oh, yeah. has thought this for years. He has a team that corrects all the misstatements on his Wikipedia page, but it's, it's back up yeah. <laughs> within a week. And so the skeptics are really very extremely well organized. I, I just don't think it's worth it trying to uh, correct the Wikipedia stuff. I, I do have a, uh, a, a page on Wikipedia that bears my name, but it's that not uh, written by you. It's not written by skeptics. It's constructed by my wife and me. So I'd just say, uh, if people want want to uh, look at my stuff, go to LarryDawson.com. Yeah. Well, how is uh, have you had any physical threats or? Uh, um... Yeah, I have. <laughs> but uh, you know, that's another story. Yeah. Uh, most of these are from people who seem to not be very well balanced. And uh, I used to keep all those letters, but I read them one day and uh, in my files dedicated to them. And I thought, I, I, I don't need to keep these things. They, they, why would I keep them? I he mean, burned them. They're sinister. They, they're, yeah, uh, they're, they're, they're ugly. They're threatening. <laughs> And so I, I had a ritual burning of all of those nasty, right. sinister right. letters. Yeah. I, I don't want to dwell on that, right. but uh, I think that everybody in my position gets that, that kind of email occasionally. Right. Yeah. And these, these were letters that were written, usually written in colored ink, multi, I don't know about the color. I don't know how that figures yeah. in, but these, these were quite, quite artistically done sometimes. Right. Yeah. Interesting. Right. I never got you famous enough to attract that much attention. I got, uh, <laughs> uh, at the end of the 60 Minutes piece, they had an old fat doctor in Southern California uh, criticize that I, I was getting rich off of wellness, which I could barely meet the payroll. But other than that, <laughs> I disappeared into Costa Rica uh, <laughs> shortly after that. and. Um, haven't been seen or heard much from since. But um, I was going to ask uh, something. Um, oh, the, the word holistic seems to be making somewhat of a comeback. It's in the title of your textbook. Uh, it's, it's went through, you know, it got alternative, CAM, and then integrative has caught on. Right. Uh, some people are concerned that, that integrative is, is a, a sellout to, uh, allopathic and that uh, it's been watered down as wellness got watered down you know we we had 
had to spell it out in the 70s, but then it became equated with dog food. And uh, right. that, that was the number one hit. Now you get a half a billion hits on uh, well, right. wellness. The, right. The thing that I'd like to say about holistic is uh, starting with the American Holistic Nurses Association, we have looked at, do we change the name? And we went, no, we're looking at wholeness mm -hmm. of the individual, of everybody, body, mind, spirit, and the connections. The, my first book came out in 88, and now it's in its eighth edition. Uh, it is a recognized textbook used in schools of nursing and, you know, in clinical practice and, uh, you know, healthcare policy and research. Uh, so I think the most important thing is for, uh, you know, all of us to uh, continue to walk our talk, uh, be strengthen our own capacities and uh, do our inner work. And I find it just um, really a, a glorious time um, at, you know, nearing the end of our career. We still have a lot of, you know, life left in us. Uh, but the fact sure is do. that our work now, we're history holders with you and others. And so now how do we take the work that we have been doing and then move it out there and mentor these young people that can continue the work. So yes. I am thrilled to say that I am with like-minded colleagues and I will say in the International Nurse Coach Association, uh, in the American Holistic Nurses Association, and truly looking at how do we strengthen people to understand what health and well-being is about. Uh, and it is uh, body, mind, and spirit. It's everything connected. And, you know, the words are so interchangeable. Integrative, alternative, complementary, holistic, mm -hmm. integral. It's just how do we find this place of coming from a place of deep, compassionate, love, and caring, of groundedness, of a calmness, and an inner stillness, putting mm -hmm. that all together. You know, one word that uh, I champion, which not many people buy into, is the word spiritual. This is something that has to do with their sense of connected with, connected with something higher than the individual self or ego. And it certainly transcends religion. Uh, I think spiritual is not a necessary component right, right. to health and longevity. Uh, there are not many of us who are comfortable with that word, but I think that it has an important place. Oh, I, I remember when the S word was, the barrier was broken, and I think you were a large part of that. Uh, it was in the 90s somewhere. We, we could never use the word uh, in the first editions of the Wellness Workbook, and then we, we cut loose in the third edition. <laughs> but it's, it's much more accepted now, uh, and, and it's also been watered down and associated with religion and all of the things that happen when something gets popularized. But I thank you for breaking the S word barrier. And uh, <laughs> we certainly couldn't say that in the 70s and 80s. No, that's right. You were a pioneer so, in that too. Thank you. Uh, with, the, with the current uh, ramping up of the whole COVID-19 uh, viral thing, which historically someone watching this you know they're going to have a whole different picture of it but we're right in the early stages of it uh, how's that affected you what are your thoughts uh since every other email is about it and, uh, well i i think it's uh perhaps ironic that a viral illness have has made people realize that we're all in it together Mm -hmm. Right. That's a recurrent phase, uh, phrase and what, all of these emails that we get from everywhere. Uh, we're all in it together. That's the message I have been trying to, to convey with this <laughs> one mind, you know, and, and maybe it takes a, a, a physical threat or a physical illness to make people realize that we are all in it together. I mean, I mean this literally that our consciousness is connected, is unitary, and is immortal. And it's odd that we have had to have a coronavirus global threat to drive home this idea that we're all in it together. 
the universe works in amazing ways. <laughs> right. And I would so also 